In 1887, the greatest challenge for the Eiffel Tower's engineers was not its height. The real difficulty lay in determining how people would ascend such a tall structure, especially when its four legs were tilted at roughly 55 degrees. How could a lift operate along such a curved path? Stairs were possible, but climbing a 300-meter tower vertically would have been extremely difficult. Interestingly, when the tower was being built, many Parisians felt it spoiled the beauty of the city. They expected it to be dismantled within 20 years, and this expectation was even written into the contract. Yet today, more than 135 years later, this 7,300-ton iron monument still stands proudly. For most people, the name Paris immediately brings the Eiffel Tower to mind. Supporting 7,300 tons on only four legs was a major engineering challenge. An even larger difficulty came from the Seine River flowing beside the site, which made the soil extremely problematic for building a stable foundation. A similar challenge had been faced 400 years earlier during the construction of the Taj Mahal's foundation. Each leg of the Eiffel Tower faced different conditions. The west and north legs stood on the riverside, where wet soil and constant water flow created severe difficulties. The south and east legs were on completely dry ground. Therefore, the foundations on the wet side had to be strengthened to match those on the dry side, because even a slight imbalance could cause the tower to lean. Let us begin with the foundations on the dry side. Excavation here was carried out manually until workers reached a very strong layer, a compact mixture of sand and gravel. Engineers chose this layer as the foundation base, which lay at a depth of about 6 to 7 meters. Rectangular pits were then created on this strong layer. This approach offered two major benefits. Each main leg of the tower consists of four smaller legs, so the load could be distributed evenly. The compact sand layer also provided excellent grip and stability for the foundation. All four footings were filled with hydraulic concrete. It is important to note that this was not the modern cement used today. Hydraulic concrete is a mixture of lime, clay, gravel, broken stone pieces, and water. Hydraulic lime naturally contains clay, enabling it to set even under water, and continuous exposure to water actually making it stronger. After all four pits were completed, stone pyramids were constructed above them. These were solid stone structures built step by step, in which small stone pieces were bonded together using hydraulic mortar. From this stage onward, the structure needed to rise in a pyramid shape. Before that, two anchor bolts, each about 6 to 7 meters long, were inserted into it, and the upper block was shaped into a pyramid, constructed at an angle of 54 degrees. Next, the four stone blocks had to be connected. For this, masonry walls were built around the foundation. And within these walls, a solid platform was formed using stone fragments bonded with mortar. In this way, the foundations on the dry side were completed. But the greatest challenges still awaited on the river side. Here, excavation reached 4 to 5 meters, but problems appeared almost immediately. Because of the wet soil, the entire site became muddy and underground water quickly filled the pits. So the engineers devised an entirely different solution. Remarkable for that era, they built wooden caissons. To understand this easily, if you place a glass upside down in a bucket of water, the trapped air prevents water from entering. Engineers used the same principle to create large wooden caissons. Their design had a working chamber at the bottom and a pipe-like shaft above it, allowing workers to descend from the top and enabling removal of excavated soil. The way this system operated was truly fascinating. The lowermost section was an airtight working chamber filled with high-pressure air, supplied by compressors. Beneath it was solid ground, preventing air from escaping. A gate was installed here, and another gate was placed slightly above it. When a worker descended from the top, he first opened the upper gate, entered the chamber, and securely closed the gate behind him. Next, compressors increased the pressure inside the intermediate chamber until it matched the pressure inside the working chamber. Once both chambers were equalized, the worker opened the working chamber's gate and moved down to begin excavation. 
If you wonder whether water could still enter from below, the answer is no. The high-pressure air inside the chamber prevented water from entering from the bottom. The wooden kaisen was extremely heavy, so as workers continued excavation, it slowly sank deeper into the ground. Eventually, after descending about 28 to 30 meters, they reached a strong gravel layer. Once the gravel layer was reached, the air pressure inside the kaisen was released, and hydraulic concrete was poured in to form a strong foundation. When this foundation rose close to surface level, construction of the stone pyramid began, exactly like those on the dry side. Anchor bolts were inserted, and the upper section was shaped into a pyramid at a 54-degree angle. In the same manner, three more stone pyramids were built. These pyramids are technically referred to as masonry stones. Masonry walls were then constructed around all these masonry stones, and these walls were shaped into arches. Their purpose was critical. Without them, the tower's load would fall directly on the stones, and in wet soil conditions, the stones could shift. The arched walls held the stones firmly and countered both lateral soil pressure and water pressure. But a natural question arises. Why were arched walls used? Why not build flat walls like those on the dry side? The main reason lies in the surrounding wet soil and water. Water pressure is uneven, and if force comes from one side, a straight wall can bend or crack. A curved arch, however, redirects the pressure vertically downward. This prevents the masonry stones from bearing the force directly and keeps the wall intact. As a result, the entire foundation behaves as a stable, unified structure. Along the sides, additional solid structures were created using mortar and a mixture of small and large stone pieces. The Taj Mahal built 400 years ago near the Yamuna River also faced similar challenges. There, engineers used a very different foundation method. They first constructed wells and filled them with wood and mortar, a mortar that gained strength when exposed to water. From each well, vertical shafts were created, and arches were built over them. These arches redirected soil and water pressure, keeping the foundation stable. This is why the underground rooms of the Taj Mahal are also arched. The Eiffel Tower used the same principle of arches, though the construction method differed due to the engineering practices and communication limitations of the two eras. A detailed explanation of the Taj Mahal's working can be seen in the referenced video. The foundation of each leg of the Eiffel Tower is perfectly symmetrical. Each pair of legs is spaced 125 meters apart. Now let us look at the anchor bolts embedded within the masonry stones. A small gap was intentionally left around them to allow slight movement. The purpose of this will become clear later. Above all the masonry stones, the base shoe was installed. This component serves as the primary link between the tower above and the concrete foundation below. From this point, structural assembly began. Various parts of the tower were manufactured in factories and transported to the site, where they were assembled one by one. In total, more than 18,000 individual parts were used to build the Eiffel Tower. An interesting aspect is that all these parts were connected using rivets. A rivet is a small iron piece heated to about 800 to 900 degrees. One worker held the hot rivet in place while another struck it with a hammer. The impact caused the rivet to expand and lock the components firmly together. In this way, nearly 2.5 million rivets were manually installed across the entire tower. Another fascinating fact is that the iron used in the tower contained about 99% pure iron and only 0.02% carbon. This extremely low carbon content caused the metal to rust very slowly. Naturally occurring slag fibers within the iron further reduced the rate of rusting. When the four legs reached a height of 57 meters, they had to be joined with a platform. However, despite precise measurements, small variations always existed between the legs. Correcting these differences became a major challenge for the engineers. The engineers had anticipated this issue and prepared for it in advance. The small gap left around the anchor bolts allowed the legs to be adjusted for alignment. But another question arose. How could such massive legs be moved? and crane technology of that era was not capable of lifting or adjusting such heavy components. To give each leg vertical support, wooden structures were constructed. For precise adjustment, 
Hydraulic jacks were installed inside each base shoe and operated manually by pumping oil. Using these jacks, the legs were leveled with micrometer precision. This was possible only because space had been left around the anchor bolts to allow movement. When the platform needed to be connected, central support was required. A structure similar to wooden scaffolding was built, and cross-bracing lattice along with horizontal tie frames were added to link the legs, providing greater stability. After these preparations were completed, the platform was finally installed. and decorative arches were added between the legs to enhance the tower's appearance. Today, the first floor of the Eiffel Tower contains extensive usable space, and restaurants have been built here as well. To reach the first floor, workers used temporary wooden scaffolding and hoist systems. But as construction progressed, a major challenge appeared. How to lift heavy components to increase heights? For this, steam-powered cranes and manual chain systems were used to hoist the parts upward. From the first floor, construction of the second floor began. The joints were connected in the same way. And at a height of 115 meters above the ground, the second floor platform was installed. From this point, construction of the top floor, known as the summit, began. The most interesting feature here is that all four legs, which had risen separately until the stage, merged into a single central shaft above the second floor. This was necessary because wind forces increased greatly at such heights. If the legs had continued separately, twisting would have intensified, and the tower's overall weight would have increased. When the top floor was completed in 1889, the tower stood 300 meters tall. Today, due to the addition of radio and television antennas, its height has increased to 330 meters. At the very top, the tower's engineer, Gustav Eiffel, even built a small room for himself. However, the greatest challenge for the engineers was determining how to reach such heights. For this reason, elevators were installed. Modern elevators move vertically and rely on counterweights. But in the Eiffel Tower, this was impossible because the legs are tilted at about 54 degrees from ground level. Therefore, a curved elevator system was needed. An engineer named Otis designed this curved elevator system. First, a special track was built inside the tower's legs. Then, a cabin was developed that would travel along this track using rollers, like a train. But how was the cabin powered? For this, a hydraulic system was constructed, which included a powerful piston. This piston was about 16 meters long. It did not power the cabin directly. Instead, several pulleys were installed, and the rope was routed through them before being connected to the cabin. Observe closely. The rope runs through multiple pulleys installed inside the tower, travels up to the second floor, and then returns through more pulleys before finally connecting to the cabin. When the hydraulic piston applied force to the pulley frame, the frame moved. As a result, when the piston moved by one meter, the cabin traveled approximately eight meters. When the piston fully extended, the cabin reached the second floor. When the cabin needed to descend, the piston retracted. But because the piston had enormous power, hydraulic accumulators were installed to maintain smooth operation. These accumulators stored pressure like counterweights and supplied a steady flow to the cylinder, ensuring smooth piston movement and smooth cabin motion. Most importantly, if the hydraulic cylinder failed, the accumulator served as a backup. Similarly, elevators were installed inside all four legs of the Eiffel Tower, each serving a different purpose, some for the public, others for staff and restaurant workers. Up to the second floor, this curved elevator system was used. But above the second floor, a different type of elevator was designed. This upper elevator system was quite similar to modern elevators. Electric motors were used, multiple sheaves were installed, and guide rails were added to guide the cabin up and down. A total of four cabins were installed. When two cabins were at the top, the other two were at the second floor level. In this system, the cabins themselves acted as counterweights. As one cabin went up, another came down, and the descending cabin provided the counterweight. In this way, around 40 to 50% of the load was balanced by the cabins, while the motor handled the remaining load. 
It took us 20 days and extensive research to create this video. If you enjoyed it, please subscribe to the channel and like the video. Thank you for watching.